Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And today's video is a special edition. Usually I have player takes, I have running back takes. Today is not that. Today is some free game, three tips, three tricks to help you think about the way in which you're constructing your fantasy team better so you can maximize your upside and help you build a super team so you can crush your league. Let's jump right into it. The first trick here is a common one, and it is stacking. Stacking is pairing teammates together, whether that's a quarterback and a wide receiver, or a quarterback and a tight end, or a running back and a wide receiver, in order to capitalize on a specific outcome that will then benefit you essentially double. And we do this, A, because it feels good when you know, Kurt Cousins throws a touchdown to Adam Thielen and you have both of them on your team, it feels nice to kind of double dip on touchdowns and get 12 points out of that instead of just six. But stacking is more important than that. It allows you to like double down on these sort of implicit bets that you're making on particular players, on particular situations, and allow you to benefit more from those things when and if they hit. Let's go over a couple examples. Number one, let's say you are in on Jalen Hurts as this year's like super upside rushing dual threat quarterback who could finish as like the QB1 in fantasy, and you take him in the the middle of the first round in a super flex draft. You're high on Jalen Hurts, you press the button in the first round of Superflex Draft. You're necessarily betting in that scenario that the Eagles offense is going to be awesome. And then let's say the end of the second round, the third round rolls around, and you're sitting there at your pick in the third round, and you've got your choice of Mike Evans, Keenan Allen, T. Higgins, and A.J. Brown. If you're looking to, to, if you're super in on this Eagles offense being good, you should probably go with A.J. Brown in this scenario to kind of break a tie between this tier of players because you've already placed a bet on the Eagles offense being really good by selecting Jalen Hurts early. And so by taking somebody other than A.J. Brown in this scenario, let's say you take Keenan Allen, for example, you're almost hedging against yourself because in the scenario that your first round pick is a good one and Jalen Hurts is a smash at that ADP, A.J. Brown is also going to smash because he's the number one wide receiver on Jalen Hurts' offense. So you should go with A.J. Brown, not just so you can double dip on touchdowns and yards when Jalen Hurts throws to A.J. Brown, but because you've already established a hypothetical world based on your draft pick where the Eagles' offense is going to smash. So if you truly believe in that and you want to double down on that and, eat and increase your team's upside in the event that that happens— you go A.J. Brown. Let's say you miss out on A.J. Brown. He went the pick before you. You got sniped. You end up going with T. Higgins instead. Good player. Good pick. Later in the draft comes around and you're looking at Dallas Goddard. You're looking at Devontae Smith in their respective tiers of the draft. Passing on A.J. Brown or missing out on A.J. Brown doesn't have to be a bad thing. You could look at that as, yeah, I'm still betting on Jalen Hurts, but I can... I can flip this around where now I'm betting against A.J. Brown as the clear-cut number one, and maybe Devontae Smith takes over, like, a, a large share of the receiving work in Philadelphia with Jalen Hurts. Maybe Dallas Goddard has an elite tight end season. You passed on A.J. Brown, but you have Jalen Hurts, and so you can create a hypothetical world based on your draft picks where now Devontae Smith is a smash at ADP while also pairing him with Jalen Hurts. And so if, you, if, you, if you're high on a quarterback, you take him, you miss out on his number one weapon, that's okay because now you can pivot to his other weapons and there's still a, you know, kind of you're creating, it's like a choose your own adventure. You're, you're creating a scenario where reasonable things have to happen for your picks to make sense and smash. And so missing out on A.J. Brown can still be okay because there's, there's a world where where Jalen Hurts smashes, but Devontae Smith is the number one wide receiver. And so, so you can make that work to your advantage, even if you get sniped on A.J. Brown. Another example of stacking that you can work to your advantage is let's say you're at the one-two turn in a single QB draft and you go Dalvin Cook and Justin Jefferson at the 112 and 201. Those are both great players. 
you're fully in on this Vikings offense now. Essentially, you're betting that this this offense is going to be incredible. You think Justin Jefferson has like wide receiver one upside. You prefer Dalvin Cook over Najee Harris and Joe Mixon and Derrick Henry and all the other running backs available right there. You double tapped Vikings. The rest of your draft should reflect then that you're in on the Vikings. And in that scenario, I'm making sure that I squeeze Kirk Cousins into my lineup somehow to get the maximum juice out of this Vikings offense goes bananas scenario that I'm in on given my first two picks. And let's say you take Trey Lance in the second round of a Superflex draft, but you miss out on Debo, kind of like this AJ Brown scenario. Now you're in on Lance, but betting against Debo, just tap the button on Ayuk, tap the button on George Kittle, and it's a win-win for you. Stacking can be really helpful, but I do think there you reach a point of diminishing returns. Let's say you took Jalen Hurts and you have AJ Brown, Dallas Goddard, and Devontae Smith. You just like triple, quadrupled down on this Eagles offense. Sounds nice, but there are only so many fantasy points to go around. You know, let's say Jalen Hurts has an awesome fantasy day and he throws for 400 yards and four touchdowns. That's 400 yards and four touchdowns to go around for three of your starting players, where if you had Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown, and then you also had Brandon Ayuk and T.J. Hawkinson, Ayuk and Hawkinson can have big days along with A.J. Brown, where all three of your Eagles receivers are probably not going to have big days all at the same time. And so you kind of cap your upside at a certain point by like overstacking. And so you reach a point of diminishing returns. That's a similar concept to my next point. My next tip here is handcuffing, but not your own handcuff. Let's say you're in the late first round. You're looking at Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Najee Harris, or Joe Mixon. Similar tier of running back there. Let's say you go with Dalvin Cook. He's just your preferred option. Later in the draft, it's like the, what, the 8th, ninth, 10th round. You're looking to add some, like, depth running backs, some high upside running backs. And so you tap the button on Alexander Madison because he also serves as, like, a handcuff, some insurance on your earlier Dalvin Cook pick. That's fine. You've raised your floor in the event of a Cook injury because you can just slot Alexander Madison in there and he's going to get you 15 points per game. He's going to be a really solid starter for you if and when Dalvin Cook misses games. But you've now created a scenario where the best case outcome for your Alexander Madison pick is for your first round pick to like tear an ACL. Alexander Madison's upside is capped by your first round pick. And so for your 10th round pick to hit, your first round pick has to disappoint. You're betting against yourself by hedging with a handcuff, which again is fine for raising your floor, but if we're shooting for championships, if we're trying to win leagues here and maximize our upside, that's not the way to go. Obviously, we can't predict injuries, but we can set ourselves up to benefit from the unpredictability of injuries as much as possible by taking other people's handcuffs. Your team's success is predicated upon Dalvin Cook hitting, so draft and live in the world where Dalvin Cook hits, and in that world, you don't need Alexander Madison. So instead of him, take Daryl Henderson, benefit from a Cam Akers injury, take Kenneth Gainwell, benefit from a Miles Sanders injury, take Michael Carter, benefit from a Brees Hall injury, Take Rashad White and benefit from a Leonard Fournette injury. Take Khalil Herbert and benefit from a David Montgomery injury. You can't control who gets hurt, but you can control how injuries impact your team. And your odds of building a dominant team are higher when your late round lottery picks can add to the impact of your early round picks rather than just replacing that impact in the event of an injury. It's like if you're in like, like a boat race, like a, like a canoe race, and you can take one of two things with you. Number one, you can have a paddle that you only get to use if somebody else's boat springs a leak. Or you can take a life jacket that you only get to use if your boat springs a leak. You're not winning shit if your boat springs a leak anyway, so you might as well take the paddle and benefit from somebody else getting fucked. If Dalvin Cook goes down, Alexander Madison is going to help you tread water. If Leonard Fournette goes down and you drafted Rashad White, now you have Dalvin Cook and Rashad White in your lineup as RB1s. The last tip I have here is kind of a general tip that kind of encompasses both of the tips I've given already, as well as a lot of other things. And that's just to simply pay attention to the implicit bets you make by not taking certain players. Let's say you're in the late first round, you're you're wanting to go wide receiver, and you're looking at Devontae Adams, Stefan Diggs, Debo Samuel, and CD Lamb. You're at the turn, let's say you go Diggs and Debo. So you pass on Devontae, you pass on CD Lamb, you got Diggs, you got Debo. What does that say about the way that you feel about the Raiders and the Cowboys? Not even the way that you actually feel about them, but given that you chose Diggs and Debo, you're now living in the world where you're not bought in, at least in terms of 
you know, putting your money where your mouth is with your draft picks, you're not bought into the Raiders and the Cowboys as far as Adams and Lamb are concerned. That's necessarily a bet against Devontae Adams, at least relative to other wide receivers in his range. And so that could either be a bet against the Raiders as a whole, or it could be a, a bet on Darren Waller, or a bet on Hunter Renfro. And a bet against C.D. Lamb by passing on him is a bet against Dak. Like, there's, there's no other weapons there. If you don't think CeeDee Lamb is a smash at his ADP, you're probably out on Dak Prescott. If, you th if you're out on Devontae Adams at his ADP, you're either out on Derek Carr, you're out on the Raiders being good, or you're super in on Hunter Renfro and or Darren Waller. And so then you need to make sure that your later picks make sense in the context of who you didn't pick earlier. And so if you go with Diggs and Debo and then you later take Dak, you're now living in a world where you like Diggs and Debo more than Lamb, and so you probably shouldn't like the Cowboys and Dak, but now you're taking Dak, and you're kind of just like fucking up the hypothetical scenarios, the choose-your-own-adventure storylines here, where the Cowboys aren't good, but now you're stuck with Dak anyway, so it's kind of like you took a player you didn't want in CeeDee Lamb by taking his quarterback and Dak later after you already bet against C.D. Lamb by taking other players of that ADP. Same thing at, like, er, earlier in the draft. Let's take you, let's say you take, like, Christian McCaffrey at the 101 over Jonathan Taylor. That doesn't mean you think that Jonathan Taylor is going to be shit all year or he's going to be terrible, but by, by pivoting off of him at the 101, maybe you then draft Naeem Hines or Michael Pittman later to capitalize on a world where the Colts' offense is just, like, more pass-happy this season, which would then make your Christian McCaffrey over Jonathan Taylor pick make sense if you think Taylor's going to get, like, less opportunities to run the ball this season. What these three tips essentially boil down to is pay attention to what your picks and non-picks imply about what's going to happen this season, and make sure that your draft as a whole makes sense within the hypothetical world that you're constructing by picking whatever players you're picking and passing on whatever players you're passing on. If you're scared, go to church, and if you want to hedge your bets, Go do it by diversifying your portfolio in another league. But in each individual league, maximize your upside by betting on yourself. Stop drafting your own handcuffs, start stacking quarterbacks and wide receivers, and pay attention to the implicit bets you're making by passing on certain players in favor of selecting others.